My journey swiftly plummeted from the pinnacle of contentment, being wedded to the town's princess, blessed with two delightful children, successfully managing my thriving business and residing in my cherished hometown to the abyss of despair within a mere few weeks. I reside in Culverson, a quaint town nestled in the heart of the Midwest. Our community is modest, with a population of only a thousand residents. The closest urban center, a small city boasting 20,000 inhabitants, sits approximately 60 miles away, with several smaller villages dotting the landscape in between. In our town, we have a handful of essential establishments to serve our needs. There are a couple of convenience stores, reminiscent of a precursor to Walmart, offering a wide array of goods from groceries to toys, clothing, office supplies, and more. For pharmaceutical needs, we have a small pharmacy, alongside a local True Value franchise and a farm store for various supplies. Dining options consist of a couple of CAFAs, as fast food restaurants are absent in our locale. Financial services are well covered with a large locally owned bank and a small credit union. Amidst these establishments, my computer services business thrives. Primarily focused on it consulting, I offer hardware solutions like computers, servers, and monitors, catering to clients who seek comprehensive network packages. Among my clientele are esteemed institutions such as the bank, the local hospital, and the school system. My closest competitor operated in the neighboring urban city, yet I still managed to attract clients from there and frequently found myself troubleshooting their networks. But before delving further into my professional life, allow me to introduce myself. I'm John Edwards, 30 years of age, standing at 6 feet tall and weighing in at 180 pounds. Up until recently, I was married to a woman I'd known since middle and high school, Amanda Butler Edwards, though soon to be remarried as our divorce has been finalized. Our union lasted seven years, which I believed were fulfilling, but evidently, Amanda had a different perspective, blindsiding me with the divorce petition. It's worth mentioning that Amanda and I weren't high school sweethearts. In fact, we scarcely interacted despite attending the same school. Our circles rarely intersected, even in university. Truth be told, I harbored some resentment towards her during those years. She was the quintessential local princess, being the daughter of Wayne Butler, who owned the town's sole bank, Butler Federal Bank. Wayne's bank extended loans to local farmers, the feed store, Mark's Superstore, and nearly every other local business. In our community, face-to-face -face banking remained the norm, with online banking struggling to gain traction. Even I, with my small operating loan, am indebted to my father-in-law's establishment. Anyway, circling back to Amanda, it wasn't until after we both earned our bachelor's degrees that she suddenly took an interest in me. Admittedly, I had harbored some fantasies about her during her high school years. She was the epitome of the classic blonde bombshell, decent height, weight, with a nice bust and curves, and to top it off, she was the head cheerleader. As for myself, I was quite active in sports, starting as a defensive end in football, playing forward in basketball, running the 1,000 and 2,000 meter races in track, and holding down center field in baseball. Now, Amanda wasn't exactly stuck up, though she might argue against that label if confronted. But she did exude an air of entitlement. In high school, she dated the quarterback, a multi-sport athlete named Simon, who also excelled at basketball and baseball. Simon eventually earned a full-ride scholarship to a different university to play football, which marked the end of their relationship. During our college years, Amanda and I traveled in different circles. She was heavily involved in her sorority, which happened to be the largest on campus, while their corresponding fraternity held the same status. They were constantly hosting events, keeping Amanda occupied outside of classes. On the contrary, I was more of a nerd. Much of my time outside of class was spent delving into hardware, software, and various systems, grappling with the intricacies of computerization. My field of study demanded as much dedication outside the classroom as within it. Moreover, I had to hold down a job to help cover expenses that my modest scholarship didn't fully address. My father served as the manager of Mark's Superstore, earning a modest salary that kept us afloat, albeit just enough to preclude any grants for me. To illustrate the vast difference in our lifestyles, 
you could quadruple the square footage of my parents' house and still not match the size of Wayne Butler's primary residence. During the summers, Dad and I would frequently embark on camping trips almost every other weekend, finding solace in the simplicity and enjoyment of fishing. Meanwhile, Amanda and her family jetted off to luxurious destinations like Aspen, the Ozarks Miami, occasional jaunts to Hawaii, and even up to Maine just for leisure. As you can gather, Amanda and I were starkly different individuals who happened to hail from the same small town. When I returned home from school, Amanda suddenly expressed an interest in dating me, almost to the point of seeming like she was stalking me. Frankly, I never quite comprehended her fascination. Yes, I had launched my own business, albeit as a one-man operation at the time. I had secured a small business grant for my startup capital and managed to turn a modest profit in the first year. Eventually, Amanda mustered the courage to ask me to dance one night when we both found ourselves at the same bar with a live band playing. Surprisingly, we clicked well on the dance floor. Thanks to my mother's insistence on learning various dance steps, I didn't embarrass myself too much. As the bar closed for the night, we parted ways with a kiss by her car and my promise to call the next day to arrange a proper date. I grew up as an only child, a result of my mother's medical condition that hindered the normal development of a fetus. I suppose you could say I was a bit of a miracle baby. In contrast, Amanda had a brother who left home at 18 and essentially disappeared, perhaps due to his strained relationship with Wayne. In the year following my graduation, tragedy struck when my father succumbed to a sudden heart attack. My mother recounted how he had been discussing mowing the yard, only for her to later discover something protruding from the small shed door at the back of our property. By then, it was too late. My father had collapsed, and despite the arrival of the ambulance, their efforts to revive him proved futile. He had already passed away by the time my mother found him. Despite our budding relationship, Amanda attended my father's funeral, offering me comfort as we laid him to rest. Her presence by my side at the cemetery, her hand in mine, was a solace amid my tears. Moreover, she displayed remarkable grace towards my mother and the handful of family members who had traveled great distances to support us during our time of grief. Fortunately, my father had ensured that our family home was fully paid off before his passing, and his substantial life insurance policy provided my mother with a steady income for the remainder of her life, provided she managed it prudently. It was a blessing amidst the challenges that lay ahead, which I'll delve into shortly. Contrary to the cliché of a man chasing a woman until she catches him, Amanda and I followed a different path. She pursued me, initiating our dates and our intimate life. While I won't delve into specifics, I'll simply say that we found great compatibility in the bedroom. Our relationship evolved into exclusivity from my perspective, and I hadn't heard any rumors of her seeing other people. We shared intimate moments together two or three times a week. There were occasions when I had to travel to outlying communities for work. Some of the larger farms sought to integrate their various computer systems, from the tractors and planters to the milking parlors and household computers, all requiring Wi-Fi access. Given the logistical challenges posed by the distance between buildings, my schedule sometimes kept me occupied into the evenings. I often wondered if Amanda spent those nights at her parents' house, waiting for my return. Ah, I nearly forgot to mention Amanda's job. Due to her major in women's studies, she struggled to find suitable employment in Culverson, so she ended up working for her father. Starting as a teller, she swiftly ascended the ranks to become vice president of the loan department. While her rapid promotion might have been attributed to nepotism, she dedicated herself to the role and diligently educated herself in the intricacies of banking, as her father desired. Reflecting back on those years, I can now see how I was maneuvered into marriage. One evening, just before Christmas, Amanda dropped the bombshell that she was pregnant and demanded to know my intentions. Raised with values instilled by my parents, I immediately proposed marriage. In hindsight, I should have been more skeptical when Amanda and her mother selected a wedding date seven months after the announcement of our engagement that Christmas. However, by the time I realized the deception regarding her pregnancy, the plans were set and countless invitations had been dispatched. Confronting Amanda, her response was nonchalant, 
She simply shrugged her shoulders and justified her actions by saying, If I left it up to you, we would never get married, let alone engaged. I love you, and you love me. This will work. As for myself, I was enamored with the town princess. Our physical chemistry was undeniable, and the thought of sharing a life with Amanda was appealing. So despite uncovering her deceit, I chose to go along with the wedding plans rather than rock the boat. Our wedding became the talk of the town, a grand affair that hadn't been witnessed in Culverson's history. Every soul was invited, and we even scheduled it for a Sunday afternoon to allow businesses to close. The feast was lavish, catered by a firm from our neighboring urban community. Our honeymoon in Barbados was quite the adventure. Amanda discovered a clothing optional beach, and she relished the freedom of nudity almost every day we were there. Surprisingly, we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves, immersing in all the island had to offer. We explored every nook and cranny on a motor scooter, and we even indulged in snorkeling adventures in the crystal clear waters of the Caribbean Sea. Upon our return from our two weeks of bliss, it was back to the grind. By then, I had expanded my business to include three technicians and a secretary slash bookkeeper to keep us organized and efficient. However, before our marriage began to unravel, we were a well-oiled machine. About a year into our marriage, Amanda announced her pregnancy, and this time it was the real deal. Our little Jennifer arrived, perfectly formed and destined to be spoiled rotten. She quickly became the apple of my eye. Two years later, we welcomed our son Oscar, who arrived in much the same fashion, completing our family and filling me with unbridled happiness. However, our seventh year together marked a shift in our relationship. Amanda's work commitments suddenly increased, with numerous evening meetings and weekend hours becoming the norm. While I could understand the occasional banking conference, the frequency of these events seemed disproportionate to the workload. Despite Amanda always being reachable on her cell phone and no signs of missed calls or unusual breathlessness in her responses, I couldn't shake a growing sense of concern. Our intimate life suffered as well, as Amanda was often absent before bedtime. With my own work keeping me occupied and the need to retire early due to early morning customer visits, our time together dwindled. Although I had more assistance with the business, it was primarily to prevent me from burning out. Despite our collective business, I prioritized being home in the evenings, especially considering Amanda's unpredictable schedule with the children. I recall vividly the last time I shared intimacy with my wife. It was a Friday evening, and to my surprise, she had already returned home and prepared a delightful supper for us. The children were ecstatic, chatting away with their mother throughout the meal, so much so that we had to remind them to eat. Afterward, we all pitched in to tidy up the table, loading the pots, pans, and dishes into the dishwasher before settling down together to watch Shrek for what felt like the umpteenth time. The children were overjoyed to have Amanda back, and she had to personally tuck them into bed that night. I was strictly forbidden from entering their bedroom. Once the little ones were settled, Amanda returned to the living room, carrying a couple of glasses of wine and adorned in high heels and a delicate garment known as a babadol, which only enhanced her beauty. We settled on the couch and sipped our wine, while Amanda whispered what she wanted me to do that night. She didn't want affection and love. No, she wanted hard, and I gladly gave her what she asked for. I exerted myself to the fullest, pouring every ounce of energy into the moment until I succumbed to a dreamless slumber. When I awoke on that Saturday morning, Amanda was already dressed, holding an envelope in her hands. Time to wake up, dummy, she said abruptly. Where was the tender woman from the previous night, and why the sudden use of dummy? Confusion clouded my mind as I tried to make sense of the situation. The kids are all dressed and ready to go to mom and dad's, she continued, her tone cold and detached. That's where I'll be spending the weekend. You've got about 48 hours to pack up your belongings and get out of my house. Monday morning, a restraining order will be issued against you, citing mental cruelty and a propensity for violence if provoked. The divorce papers in this envelope will be filed at the same time. I was dumbfounded, struggling to comprehend this sudden turn of events. Summoning whatever courage I could muster, I managed to stammer, What's happening? Why are you doing this? Simple, stupid, she retorted dismissively. 
Simon has joined the bank as dad's right-hand man, and we're getting married as soon as my divorce is finalized. We've been reconnecting for months, and now it's time to make it official. With those words, she delivered the final blow to my world. Oh, and by the way, she added casually, Simon can't have children, so he wants to adopt Jennifer and Oscar. With that, she slammed the door shut behind her, leaving me to grapple with the shattering pieces of my life. For the first 12 hours of that fateful weekend, I found myself immersed in the contents of the envelope, repeatedly digesting its implications. Amanda's demands were staggering. She didn't just seek possession of the house, she aimed to claim ownership of my business as well. According to the terms outlined, I could continue to operate the business, but my earnings would be reduced to minimum wage, even less than what my employees earned. She insisted on full custody of the children, with the requested child support exceeding any feasible income I could generate under her oppressive terms. Moreover, she had already drained most of our savings, leaving me with a pittance. Despite her anticipated higher earnings, she sought alimony from me, ignoring the gross inequity of our financial circumstances. While her car was titled in her name, mine was owned by the company, affording me a means of transportation as long as I remained employed. Faced with the harsh reality of my predicament, I resolved to take action. I reached out and secured a loan for a pickup truck and trailer, knowing that our mutual friends wouldn't be of much assistance. Desperate for support, I called upon a few old high school acquaintances who readily came to my aid. Together, we loaded the trailer with belongings that Amanda was unlikely to contest. With nowhere else to turn, I sought solace in the familiarity of my workplace. Having purchased the entire building the previous year to accommodate expansion, I discovered a small, neglected apartment on the second floor. Determined to make it my temporary refuge, I rolled up my sleeves and spent the entirety of Sunday cleaning and organizing. An air mattress served as my bed, while hand-me-down furniture and kitchenware provided by my friends offered some semblance of comfort. A modest microwave became my culinary companion, supplemented by a cooler filled with ice to keep my beers chilled until I could procure a refrigerator. Monday morning greeted me with stiffness and discomfort, a stark reminder of the perils of sleeping on an air mattress, an experience I wouldn't recommend except in dire emergencies. The shower offered no reprieve, with cold water cascading down due to the lack of hot water on the second floor. A meager tank provided the only source of warmth, relegated to the bathroom in the office downstairs. Despite my less than ideal circumstances, I managed to muster a semblance of presentability after a shave. Determined to seek legal counsel, I reached out to several local attorneys, only to be met with a chilling reception. It seemed my father-in-law had already tainted my reputation, spreading word of my perceived transgressions. No help was forthcoming, and any loans I might have relied upon were now at risk of being called in. With no time to secure representation from afar, I found myself in court that morning, standing alone and vulnerable. Judge James presided over the proceedings, and an uneasy feeling settled in the pit of my stomach. His close ties to the Butler family, evident from his frequent appearances at their events, coupled with the likelihood that his financial affairs were intertwined with Butler Federal Bank, did little to assuage my apprehension. The judge's first words were directed at me, his tone stern. Mr. Edwards, why are you not represented by counsel? Your Honor, I humbly apologize. I responded, attempting to maintain composure. I was served with the papers by my wife on Saturday morning, leaving me little time to seek legal representation before today's hearing. Despite my efforts, no local attorney was willing to take my case. I respectfully request a continuance to seek counsel from outside the area. Denied came the swift reply. I fail to comprehend your reasoning. According to the records, these papers were filed three weeks ago, and this court date was set accordingly. Furthermore, it's noted that you were served at your place of business on the same day by the deputy. You had ample opportunity to secure representation and submit the necessary financial documents. Your attempt to delay these proceedings is both flagrant and contemptible. Your Honor, I must protest and request that this be entered into the official court record, I exclaimed, desperation evident in my voice. 
I feel as though I'm being coerced into a settlement that overwhelmingly favors my wife, with the sole intent of destroying me rather than genuinely benefiting our children. As our earnings records are filed jointly, my wife should have been able to provide my financial standing, rendering the unreasonable request for child support baseless. Additionally, she has announced her intention to remarry immediately upon our divorce being finalized, rendering alimony unnecessary. The judge banged his gavel emphatically. Silence. You, sir, are out of order. You've had ample time to respond to the summons. I rule in favor of the plaintiff, he declared firmly, slamming the gavel down once more before abruptly exiting the chamber. I was left reeling, the reality of my situation sinking in with brutal force. In a matter of minutes, I was divorced, facing the prospect of limited access to my children, and my business had been stripped away. Glancing at my ex-wife, Amanda, I detected a flicker of guilt in her expression, quickly masked by a haughty stare. You better get to work, she admonished coldly. I don't pay you to sit around looking like someone just ruined your day. As hatred threatened to consume me, I forced myself to maintain composure, acutely aware of the watchful eye of the bailiff. It was clear he harbored no warmth toward me. Simon and Amanda's attorney rose from their seats, exiting the courtroom. I remained seated, biding my time. I couldn't afford to provide them with any ammunition that might land me in jail, a realization that dawned on me as a plausible goal of theirs. The bailiff approached me discreetly. They should be out of the building by now, he whispered. The other bailiffs are keeping watch, but you know the influence the butlers wield in this town, even in the county. Get yourself a lawyer from the state capitol. That should put enough distance between you. We sympathize with your situation, but can't risk being implicated. I nodded in appreciation and thanked the bailiff for his discreet counsel. Stepping out of the courtroom, I couldn't shake the feeling of being scrutinized by the uniformed personnel lined up to observe my departure. Heading straight to the office, I was surprised to find that Amanda and Simon hadn't arrived ahead of me. Their overconfidence had played in my favor for once. Without delay, I ensured that all staff members were preoccupied with their tasks. Seizing the opportunity, I hastily drafted a check for cash and dispatched our secretary slash bookkeeper to the bank with strict instructions. She was to explain that I would be out of town servicing distant clients and required cash for the trip. I chose not to visit the bank personally, anticipating potential obstruction. Unless a court order had explicitly transferred ownership of the business, the bank had no grounds to refuse the transaction. Such occurrences were not uncommon in small towns, where cash transactions were preferred over debit or credit cards to avoid the fees imposed by banks and credit companies. With my name still on the bank's signature card, I had the authority to withdraw the necessary funds. Aware that my credit and debit cards were rendered useless, I opted for the old-fashioned green bills adorned with the faces of deceased presidents. Although there was ample cash in the account to cover the upcoming payroll, I couldn't bear to see my staff suffer. Restraining myself, I withdrew only a modest sum, ensuring that they would be compensated. Additionally, I emptied the petty cash drawer, leaving behind an I.O. directed at my ex-wife and her new partner. Resigned to my newfound role as the defeated party, a burning desire for vengeance began to simmer within me. Amanda, Simon, and Wayne needed to face consequences for their actions. As for Wayne's involvement, it was clear to me that he was the mastermind behind the ordeal. Had it not been for his influence, I would have been served with the divorce papers earlier, securing the opportunity to enlist the help of a local attorney and receive a fair judgment from the court. But Wayne's disdain for me, coupled with Amanda's compliance, fueled their scheme to exact revenge. In the late afternoon, Amanda and Simon finally made their appearance at the office, ready to assume control. Presenting Dorothy, our secretary, with signed court documents showcasing the transfer of ownership to a new corporation, they'd relegated me to the role of a mere manager rather than an owner. Fortunately, they refrained from publicly announcing my diminished status and salary. With only Dorothy privy to the details necessary for processing payroll, the rest of the staff remained oblivious to the discrepancy in our earnings. Aware that Dorothy would likely inform the rest of the staff about the changes, I resolved to maintain business as usual, at least for the time being. 
When Amanda and Simon made their unwelcome appearance, I quickly concocted an excuse about attending to a client's urgent needs and swiftly departed. The last thing I needed was to risk violating the protection order and inadvertently play into their hands. Thankfully, the protection order only mandated that I stay a hundred feet away from any of them. However, in our small town, such a distance might as well have banished me to a life under a bridge outside of town. After wrapping up work, I sought solace in one of the local bars, owned by a client of mine. Thanks to my efforts in computerizing his point-of-sale system, he could manage his operations efficiently. As I approached the bar, the owner greeted me with regret in his eyes. I'm sorry, John, but I can't serve you, he said quietly, his voice tinged with sympathy. Words out, serving you, talking to you, or even being friendly could spell trouble with loan accelerations. You'll have to leave. Understanding the gravity of the situation, I nodded in acknowledgement. Aware of the blind spots in his security camera system, I discreetly made my way to the back door. Waiting for me outside was the owner, a 12-pack of my favorite beer in hand. John, I'm sorry, he murmured, offering the gesture as a peace offering. Hopefully, Butler will come to his senses and put an end to this nonsense. With that, he slipped back into the bar, leaving me alone with my thoughts and a small token of solidarity. I hugged the wall, making my way back to my desolate apartment. To my surprise, I found a used but functional mattress, box springs, and Hollywood frame propped against the back door. Relief washed over me. I wouldn't have to endure that airbed again. After icing down the beer, I maneuvered the bed up to my apartment and set it up. With the aid of five or six beers and a relatively comfortable bed, I enjoyed a better night's sleep. The following day, I headed to Mark's for groceries. However, as I approached the checkout lane, I was escorted out without my purchases. Mark himself appeared, expressing regret as he informed me of his inability to defy Wayne Butler's influence. John, I like you and your family, but I can't go against Wayne, he explained. With a shove, he ushered me out, wearing a forced expression of anger to maintain appearances. That evening, I discovered all the groceries I had selected neatly packed in a wooden box with a padlock beside my back door. The key lay on the driver's side front tire of my car. As I attempted to move the box, I realized it was surprisingly heavy, its bottom reinforced with steel plates. It became evident that my mysterious benefactor had taken precautions to prevent theft. Though it wouldn't deter a determined individual, it served as a deterrent to the average passerby. Leaving the box outside, I ventured out of town for a couple of days to attend to other clients. A seed of an idea began to take root in my mind. Unable to procure what I needed locally, I stopped by a small out-of-town service station and purchased some small fuel cans, along with regular gasoline and diesel fuel. On each trip out of town, I diligently acquired a couple of key items necessary for my plan's execution. Meanwhile, Amanda and Simon intensified their efforts to torment me. I was compelled to change my phone number due to Amanda's incessant calls, only to have law enforcement officers visit me repeatedly, accusing me of violating the protection order. Despite proving that I never answered her calls, I endured their harassment, being told to quit messing around and leave each time. The situation escalated to the point where I couldn't even fuel up my car, a company vehicle, no less, without encountering trouble. I had to delegate the task to someone else just to ensure I could continue with my work. My scheme finally reached fruition when Butler Federal Bank began harassing my mother. She received countless calls urging her to take out a reverse mortgage, while the county claimed they hadn't received her tax payment. Upon contacting the tax office, I learned that Wayne Maines was exerting pressure on them to harass my mother. This was the last straw. Wayne had crossed the line. Unable to threaten my mother directly with a mortgage, he resorted to other means of harassment, causing her undue stress. I had had enough. With just a week to prepare, I knew my retaliation had to be swift and effective. I planned to strike in the dead of night, when only a few officers were on duty and likely dozing in their cruisers. In addition to plotting my revenge, I secured an old, dilapidated pickup truck from a farmer in a neighboring town, refraining from immediately registering it, as the plates were still valid for a few more months. 
The farmer discreetly stashed the vehicle behind an abandoned house about a mile outside of town, ensuring it remained hidden until I was ready to execute my plan. Under the shroud of nightfall, just after the town's businesses had all shuttered their doors, I initiated the plan. Before commencing, I meticulously ensured that each establishment was dark and deserted. While my intent was to cause minimal harm, there were a select few individuals whom I wouldn't mind seeing face some physical consequences. With resolve, I began by remotely disabling the fire alarm systems in the targeted businesses, all of which I had originally installed. I bypassed the hospital and the bank, as tampering with their systems could potentially violate federal laws. My first stop was the convenience store on the outskirts of town. With a swift blow from a brick, I shattered the glass door. Armed with a makeshift Molotov cocktail, created by combining diesel fuel and gasoline, I ignited the wick and hurled it inside, ensuring it caught a shelving unit to break the bottle upon entry. Across town, I repeated the same tactic at the other convenience store, the wails of approaching sirens marking the response of the volunteer fire department to the initial blaze. A smirk played on my lips. Wayne, who had maneuvered his way into becoming the volunteer fire chief and sat on the fire department's board of trustees, had always been obstinate about allocating funds for improvements. Tonight would serve as a reckoning for his short-sightedness. My next destination was the farm supply store, where the manager had always been a vile character, even before my own persecution began. There, I strategically deployed three Molotov cocktails at various points within the building, ensuring the fire could spread rapidly. Despite the sprinkler system activating, the lack of supplemental water from the overwhelmed fire department rendered it futile, allowing the flames to engulf the store unchecked. As the flames engulfed most of the commercial area in town, I placed a call to my former residents using a burner phone. Through the electronic voice changer I had acquired, I kept it brief and to the point. Disguised as Darth Vader, I warned Amanda about an arsonist and advised her to take herself and the kids to my mother's house for safety. From a discreet vantage point down the street, I observed as Amanda left about an hour later with the kids, heading towards her parents' lavish mansion. I anticipated her reaction, but she was in for a surprise. Taking my time, I ensured that my old house was ablaze before casually strolling a couple of blocks to my car. Upon Amanda's arrival at her parents' gated community, yes, our quaint town indeed boasted a gated enclave complete with security patrols. She was greeted with the sight of their home engulfed in flames, her mother standing outside in distress. It turned out that I had overseen the computer system for the gated community and their security company. Conveniently, the security patrol was occupied responding to a break-in alarm when the fire ignited. Later, I learned that Amanda and her mother lingered for a while before eventually retreating to my mother's house, as even the local motels were grappling with computer system issues and unable to accommodate guests. My final act was to park the company car at the office. With a calculated move, I tossed in my last Molotov and set the vehicle ablaze. Unbeknownst to Amanda, Simon, and her conniving father, I had terminated the insurance policies on both the building and the vehicles. I proceeded to the first fire scene, where the fire department was grappling with the blaze in an attempt to prevent further spread. Wayne stood nearby, adorned in his extravagant white fire gear and matching helmet, orchestrating the efforts of the somewhat inebriated crew. With the police occupied across town investigating the other fires, there was no one to impede my advance. Due to Wayne's refusal to cooperate and his deliberate efforts to alienate neighboring departments, no additional fire departments were en route to offer assistance. The consequences of his actions were catching up to him now. Approaching Wayne from behind, I utilized the voice changer once more. Placing a small dowel against his back, I delivered the message as Darth Vader. Do not turn or make any sudden movements, or you may face severe consequences. Wayne froze, about to protest, but I silenced him. Shut up and listen. Your town is burning down, and unless you mend your ways, further consequences will follow. No one is immune to retribution, not even your own home, which is now engulfed in flames. Heed this warning and change your behavior. Ensuring he remained immobilized, I gave him a forceful shove, causing him to land in a muddy puddle. His pristine white gear was now thoroughly soiled, much to his dismay. 
As he attempted to rise, I nudged him back down with my foot, leaving him with a face full of mud and water. With that, I departed, vanishing into the onlookers gathered to witness the futile firefighting efforts. Making my way to the concealed pickup, I drove out of the vicinity, keeping a safe distance. I knew that despite the corruption, an incident of this magnitude would prompt at least some investigation, and I'd fully expected to come under suspicion. I relocated to a bustling metropolitan area, three states away from my hometown. There was no attempt on my part to conceal my identity or establish a new persona. Frankly, I didn't see the point. My access to my children had been severed, they were now under Simon's care. Financially, I was destitute, unable to provide child support or alimony. With law enforcement likely on my trail, I refrained from launching a new business endeavor. Instead, I secured a position in the aid field, a familiar domain where I resumed my previous line of work. I exercised caution, even driving considerable distances from my apartment to make phone calls using a burner phone driven by my paranoia of being tracked. As it turned out, my apprehension may have been unnecessary. When I finally reached out to my mother, she greeted me with relief, eager to share the latest developments in her hometown. Firstly, I'm relieved to hear from you. Initially, there were concerns that you might have been inside the apartment during the fire, but no evidence of your remains was found. Eventually, speculation arose that you had left town after leaving a resignation letter for Amanda and Simon, which likely perished in the fire. Thanks for reaching out promptly to let us know you're alive. Secondly, Amanda and Simon's marriage didn't come to fruition. It transpired that Simon was already married in another state and hadn't finalized his divorce. Amanda and the children stayed with me until she could secure a new residence, which ironically is smaller than your former home. Lastly, the aftermath of the fires revealed a tangled web. Many of the businesses and homes affected were insured through the bank's insurance agency. The substantial claims incurred prompted the insurance company to sever ties with the agency. Upon investigating, they discovered that Wayne Butler, as fire chief, had impeded the adoption of modern firefighting practices and neglected to establish necessary mutual aid agreements. Consequently, the insurance company is pursuing legal action against Wayne for his role in the calamitous losses. Additionally, a new bank has established a presence in our town, and many of the businesses affected by the fires have secured loans from this institution, denting the profits of Butler Federal Bank. Unbeknownst to me, Butler Federal Bank had a board of directors who are displeased with Wayne's management. He's currently under close scrutiny. Furthermore, since Amanda's marriage plans with Simon fell through, she has rescinded the protection order and is eager to reconnect with you. Moreover, the children remain legally yours. Amanda has petitioned the judge for modifications to the divorce proceedings, as the finalization hadn't reached the 90-day mark. It's possible you're still legally married. The kids continue to inquire about you daily when they visit here after school. In a surprising turn of events, it came to light that Judge James had a collection of cars, a fact he had kept under wraps until that night. Unfortunately for him, the collection was destroyed in the fires. Rumor has it that Wayne, in an attempt to minimize expenses, only insured the cars with basic liability coverage. As a result, the judge suffered significant financial losses, leading to a notable change in his demeanor towards Wayne Butler. We're currently in the process of searching for a new police chief as the sheriff has decided not to seek re-election, leading to several resignations among deputies and officers. Amanda's parents are in a predicament, seeking a place to live after their house was completely destroyed. Unfortunately, finding suitable temporary accommodation is proving difficult, and the prospect of rebuilding their home seems uncertain due to a lack of willing builders. Amanda even approached me about selling or renting them my house, but I couldn't bring myself to trust them given their past treatment of my son. Wayne tried to assert himself, but his legal troubles have weakened his influence and even the tax assessor refused to bend to his demands. Interestingly, my missing tax payment magically reappeared after that night, coinciding with some unexpected fiery mishaps involving the assessor's vehicles. It appears that Wayne's grip on power is loosening and many are relieved by the prospect of change. It seems the fires have left most people unperturbed, with many viewing them as a cleansing force.
However, the affected business owners and Wayne Butler are understandably distressed. Well, it looks like I'll have to plan a visit home very soon, I replied with a chuckle. But I might need to arrange for a more reliable vehicle first. My old ride barely made it here. I'll see you soon, Mom. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.